Well, good afternoon here in London, and I'll say good morning over in Washington, D.C. I am thrilled to, to welcome you to today's uh, event with City Forum and Xi'an, uh, the city, part of the City Forum 2023 Resilience Series, Managing Critical Events. And I am really delighted to have a regular guest here, uh, Professor Sir David Oman. Uh, it's great, but we're here, joined here by two new faces, and we're delighted to welcome uh, John Amalika Smith, who's dialing in from D.C., and James Arbuthnot, who you can see is in a busy place, apparently called the House of Lords. Um, and I probably say David's taking a political statement today by being at the Reform Club, I, I guess, in contrast. Uh, you know me, I'm Michael Minelli, and you know that uh, the way that we run these things, uh, the details are up there. Uh, they've been sent to you before on their bios and CVs. And so we're going to try and get right into the meat of the matter. Um, so the first thing, it was just a very fast poll question. Fingers on buzzers, please. Do you consider your country wherever you reside, although we're conscious there'll be a, about a two-thirds UK preponderance here, do you consider your country to be resilient in the face of critical events? Um, as ever, folks, our audience is very fast at answering uh, poll questions. So, Sasha, you can show the results as we've got uh, over three-quarters of the audience who voted. Uh, there you go. Well, oh, my gosh, identical there. 70-30. So uh, to know, so they do not consider the country to be resilient in the face of critical events. Uh, these are not statistically valid polls, and I guess anybody who comes onto an event called managing critical events probably has their own views. But a pessimistic audience panelist, let's see if we can make it more optimistic. And to do that, I'm going to hand over to Mark Lee. Mark, the floor is yours. Thank you, Michael. Delighted to welcome you all to uh, this afternoon session, the fourth in our resilience discussions 2023-2024. Uh, we're particularly pleased that David Oman is still back with us, and James Arbuthnot, who's helped us on many occasions, delighted that he's with us, and John Amalika Smith, who is our principal guide and friend, a great expert on space in America, uh, and space is one of the areas that Michael wants to cover today. After this um, uh, particular session, we're going into two more. One is um, what financial strength do you have to have to be resilient? We're doing this with uh, some of Michael's some colleagues at ZN. And in the new year, we're developing a project uh, in the cabinet office, with the cabinet office, which takes further the areas we've been discussing. Um, I present thanks from City Forum to everybody uh, be because of all the, the um, warnings that, that Michael has provided to contributors about timing. Shan't say any more. City Forum is d delighted that this event is happening, and, and we look forward to a, a really interesting afternoon, Michael. Great, thank you, Mark. Well, if I could turn to the program, just a very quick reminder to you out there in the audience: uh, we're going to have an opening round, Robin, three, two to three minutes each, followed by a panel discussion where we'll be covering three themes. We'll come to that. Uh, but at uh, hopefully just, just around uh, half four London time, we will turn to you, the audience, uh, for questions, uh, answers, responses, comments, what have you. So please be ready, uh, and you can send them in starting now. Uh, you Please do use the GoToWebinar facility. All the questions, comments, and observations you make will be sent to the panelists as well uh, with your email attached. So if you want to get in touch with them, just say so. Um, we'll, we'll have that for about uh, 20, 25 minutes, and then we're going to... Uh, move uh, for some final comments and statements. So if I could, uh, to the next slide, you will see. Uh, David, the floor is very much yours. Your thoughts on managing critical risks. Thank you very much, Michael. I think it's helpful to think about emergencies, crises, and indeed the occasional disaster. Not every emergency needs to become a crisis. Not every crisis needs to slide into disaster. So think about crisis as that state between manageable, if painful, emergencies on the one hand and disaster, catastrophe on the other. And the crisis period is when, uh, could be for quite a short period, events are out of control. And the deciding factor is whether we've anticipated the types of problem that we might face and we've prepared ourselves by investing in more resilient systems. Then you can keep the crisis period quite short. Uh, you can manage the situation and adapt your emergency plans and capabilities. But if we haven't made that investment in forethought 
and indeed in physical infrastructure, we risk sliding into disaster. I'm an optimist. I think we can all afford to do something to improve resilience at a personal and family level, at an organizational level, and at a national level. There's no answer to the question how resilient we need to be. You don't need to answer that question. What we do know is that we are not resilient enough. And I'm with the 70% who said we have serious uh, deficiencies. Sure, we've had bad times in the past. 1666, the Great Fire of London, wiped out the centre of London. Uh, it took a long time to recover from that. But my point is we're much more vulnerable in an increasingly hyper-connected world, dependent on advanced electronics, on the flow of information to keep our internet-connected uh, society running. So we are more vulnerable. So I think the onus is on us to really push for more investment in more resilient systems. End of message. Uh, Michael, I think you must have been asking me to, to speak, but you were muted. So I would actually ask me. Uh, David, you, sound, you said you were an optimist. You sounded like a pessimist. I'm, I'm a pessimist. Um, I chaired the House of Lords Select Committee on Risk Assessment and Risk Planning. That was a committee which came into existence because when COVID hit us, the government had received advice that if there was going to be a coronavirus pandemic, it might lead to up to 100 UK fatalities. 229,000 UK fatalities later, we realized that that was a bit of an underestimate. So what conclusions do I draw from that? First, government predictions are wrong. Do not rely on government predictions. Uh, so we need independent challenge of those predictions and independent challenge about what to do about it. Um, and we need to bring in the whole of society uh, for the assessment of risks, for planning about risks, for training, for exercising. Um, and we need to recognise that we won't get our predictions right as to what risks are actually going to materialise. So we need to be flexible and agile and diverse in order to avoid groupthink. That's my spiel. Fantastic. Thank you, James. And Johnny, your thoughts? Thank you, Michael. It's an honour to be part of this distinguished panel, and I would like to thank City Forum and ZYN for the opportunity. As a disclaimer, the views presented here are entirely my own and not reflective of the United States government or my affiliated institutions. I've been asked to prepare some remarks on reimagining security and resilience as it relates to critical events in the realm of space security. First, it's helpful to explain what does resiliency mean? One definition is that it refers to the process as well as the outcome of adapting to challenging life experiences. And if you'll permit me a philosophical opening before venturing into the topic of space security and resiliency, I'd like to share with you this short, profound folktale on resiliency. A long time ago, the son of a king of Persia was raised alongside the son of the Grand Vizier, and their friendship was legendary. When the prince ascended to the throne, he said to his friend, while I attend to the affairs of the kingdom, will you please write me a history of men and the world so that I can draw the necessary lessons from it and thus know the proper way to act? Similar to the theme of today's webinar on managing critical events. The king's friend consulted with the most famous historians, the most learned scholars, and the most respected sages. Five years later, he presented himself proudly at the palace. Sire, he said, here are 36 volumes relating the entire history of the world from creation to your ascension. 36 volumes, cried the king. How will I ever have time to read them? I have so much work administering my kingdom, seeing to my 200 queens. Please, friend, condense your history. Two years later, the friend returned to the palace with 10 volumes. But the king was at war against the neighboring monarch. He was found on a mountaintop in the desert, directing battle. 
The fate of our kingdom is being played out as we speak. Where would I even find the time to read 10 volumes, abridge your history even further? The vizier's son left and worked three years on a single volume to give an accurate picture of the essence. The king was now caught up in legislating. How lucky you are to have the time to write quietly. While you've been doing that, I've been debating taxes and their collection. Bring me tenfold fewer pages. I'll spend my evening mining them. Two years later, it was done. But when the friend returned, he found the king bedridden in dreadful pain. The friend himself was no longer young. His wrinkled face was hallowed by a mane of white hair. Well, whispered the king with his dying breath, the history of men. His friend gazed steadily at him as the king was about to die. And he said, they suffer majesty. So when we consider the concept of resiliency in the face of suffering, whether it be in the life of a country or that of an individual, a bridge between these two levels, in my opinion, is embracing the notion that every decision is accompanied with risk. And it's how we choose to learn from failures and setbacks in our decision making at the national level that defines our collective national resiliency. There's an insightful African proverb that says, when elephants fight, it's the grass that suffers. And the same can be said for when states launch destructive kinetic anti-satellite tests that produce harmful clouds of orbital debris. Not only do these tests, such as the Russian Federation's test on November 15th, 2021, undermine a sustainable space environment for all, but as the commercial space economy expands, officials are concerned about overcrowding in low Earth orbit. All that to say, a, consider, a starting point in considering space security and resiliency is to recall the proverb guidance that when elephants fight in space, it's humanity that suffers. And how do we choose to manage those risks? Thank you. Great. Well, super. We uh, turn uh, with fables and all to the first uh, uh, bit of our panel discussion. Our first theme is how resilient do we need to be? Um, and so we've got an optimist, a pessimist, and somebody from outer space, which is, which is super. Um, <clears throat> But um, I, I think, uh, you know, D David, you opened with a, a quick thought there about, uh, is it really possible to, to set this? Yeah, I, I'm a member of the UK National Preparedness Commission. It has a, a website and they've just published a big report by the consultancy, Marsh McLennan, trying, uh, setting out how could you begin to measure national resilience so that you could then begin to say whether you 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 had it enough the truth is i think at the moment we don't know enough to be able to produce sort of accurate metrics but what we can do is spot uh, 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 peaks of vulnerability we can spot certain in the future certain kinds of events that at some point will occur so i think we we do know enough to be able to target some early resilience investment i'm quite in favor of a mix of what i call maxi min and mini max strategy mm -hmm. so uh, mini max is minimizing the maximum harm to the public that one of these events could do. And a lot of them will be painful, they will be serious, but they're not at the maximum end of the scale. But if we lose our national grid, our electricity supply, if we lose telecommunications, if we have a major nuclear reactor accident, these are at the, the maximum end of the scale. So early priorities work on those. But then we also have to maximize the minimum level of assurance we can give the ordinary public. And the best way to do that is to make sure we've got good emergency services uh, linked into local government. We've got the right kind of military capability that can come and help if necessary. And with the kind of flexible plans that James uh, was talking about, it's not gonna deal with the worst kinds of things, but it gives that public confidence that at least there's a minimum level 
of response that would come uh, from the system. But it's an art to know where you're balancing those, those two strategies. I find that uh, quite insightful, actually. Um, I, I happen to sit uh, with you, as you know, uh, on Lord Toby Harris's National Preparedness Commission, and, and obviously read the same report, which uh, I think was honest. It, it sort of said, we can get this far, we can't go that far. Uh, here at Zen, we've been doing a lot for 30 years on using option theory to value investment. Um, but we fail, I think, when it comes to networks of risk, which, which is interesting. And for those of you in the audience, the mini max maxi min approach was the approach used by uh, programmers in computing to develop uh, chess programs uh, really up until Deep Blue uh, when they had constraints and they played pretty credible games using this, which I think was there. Uh, James, you, you've been in the defense sector. You've had to make all of these kinds of trade-off decisions. Uh, how do you, how do you, you're, you're pulled everywhere. Uh, how do you, how do you address that? Yes. And quite apart from anything else, you're pulled, pulled in certain directions by money. Um, because however much we might want to be completely resilient, uh, the issue of afford affordability, of course, comes into it. One of the things that is different now from what happened 200 years ago is that the population of the world is now 8 billion rather than 1 billion. And the complexity of managing such a population means that we are required somehow to be dependent on all of this technology that David rightly draws attention to. Um, and yet that technology, uh, while, it, while it's brought wonderful boosts and boons, uh, makes us increasingly vulnerable uh, because the technology itself can be turned off. For example, as David suggests, by turning off the uh, electricity supply and it also the technology creates a an issue of new technical threats that can be brought against us we now have as we did in 200 years ago the capacity to destroy the world and when people have that capacity have the capacity to do things sooner or later they try it out to see how it goes um, so I look on how resilient do we need to be a bit like the question of how much cholesterol is good for you. And if you ask a doctor about that question, they will say, whatever your level of cholesterol, it's probably a good idea to bring it down a bit. I would say with resilience, whatever your level of resilience, probably it's a good idea to bring it up a bit. Okay. Shana, um, space, uh, we, we were discussing in the, the green room, if I can call it that, uh, two things, uh, <clears throat> Carrington events, uh, i.e. Uh, massive solar flares, uh, and we were also uh, about to touch on um, the Kessler syndrome, the idea that you set up equivalently a, a fission reaction uh, in space through debris particles, um, uh, and it is intriguing how those particles are, you know, all man-made, 30,000 over uh, pieces over 10 centimeters and probably about a million. We just don't have the radar to track them. Now, in all of this, one of the interesting things, and I think, James, you alluded to it, um, is we're expecting technology to handle the big issues of our day. And if I say that those are the 17 sustainable development goals, you know, no hunger, no poverty, et cetera, um, uh, apparently 40% of them depend on space working uh, for GPS, uh, for satellite monitoring, for telecom. So, how do we know that we're doing enough there when this, if we, if we fail in space, we fail in a lot of other areas? Thank you, Michael. Excellent framework for that. How do you know when enough is enough in, in space? I, I think a helpful guidepost in answering this question is to look at the history of space exploration, also the history of conducting anti-satellite um, counter space weapons test in outer space. I, I mentioned that uh, earlier in my, my opening remarks, it was not just the Russian Federation, however, that has conducted these highly destructive tests. Uh, India has also conducted uh, one in 2019, China in 2007 with a one ton weather satellite orbiting in low Earth orbit, and the United States in 2008. Um, Regardless of the actor, however, space junk poses a serious, chronic, and indiscriminate threat to all spacefaring and uh, aspiring uh, nations. And recently, the news source Universe Today reported that if war were to occur in outer space, 
orbital debris, space junk, would destroy all remaining satellites in orbit in the next 40 years. And I offer this, uh, this statement as a, a counterpoint to consider when you ask, are, how do we know that we're doing enough, thinking that in the next 40 years, if war were to break out, it could render this orbit un unusable, not just for our, our use today, but for future generations as well. I mean, think of being a good steward in space. What does that look like? Considering the seventh generation principle, the actions today in space exploration and, and uh, counter space weapons usage, how will that impact seven generations from now? Using that as a framework to a frame rather to consider managing critical events in this domain, because orbital debris, at the end of the day, it, yes, it raises ethical implications because of the indiscriminate harm and the ability to inhibit future generations to advance that frontier of scientific knowledge. Yeah, it is interesting, you know, that so much of this is moving from the natural world to man-made worlds and man-made issues. It's intriguing. Uh, James, you said follow the money, right? And I, I kind of agree with that uh, um, in a lot of ways, uh, you know, back to Jerry and the shows. But, um, well, you know, you've been pulled like that as well. How do you decide in a program that, you know, this is the expenditure limit, especially when you get to points where, you know, 50% doesn't work, 90% doesn't work, it's got to be 100%. Yeah, one of the, I mean, let's start by saying you will get it wrong. Um, but let's go on by saying that it's quite difficult to persuade a government to uh, create resilience when they know that they have a cost of living crisis. There are immediate demands on their purse or our purse. Uh, and it is difficult to persuade the government to create a resilience to deal with something that may never happen. For example, a solar flare could be absolutely devastating, but it may not happen for the next 10, 15, 20 years. How do you, do, how do you persuade a Chancellor of the Exchequer to take money away from the schools and the hospitals that he knows that he needs now uh, in order to spend that money on, so, on something that may not happen for the next 10 or 15 years. David is just about to answer that question, which I'm looking forward to because I haven't an answer to it. Excellent, well, David. It, it is absolutely right. But let me inject another thought, a parallel thought. We know with security that it's easier to design security into a new system than try and retrofit it into an existing system. And I suspect the same is true with many aspects of resilience. So James has pointed correctly, we can't afford to do everything, but how do we set up incentives that mean that when new investments are being made, they, there is an incentive on the commercial companies in particular to actually spend a bit more or put a little more thought into how would, are they really dependent on a GPS signal? Is there a fallback? Is there an alternative? How would they, doing that new investment, I mean, it's going to take then 10 years perhaps for some of that to pay off. But nonetheless, in addition to a little bit being done now that we can afford, we could do a lot just by trying to build the right kind of incentives. I, I see it as a, it's an element of corporate social responsibility for a company. It should be good for reputation. It should be a unique selling point that our product will keep you going, even in uh, difficult times ahead. But I suspect that's not how it's seen. Hmm. Well, yeah, I'm just coming on that. Of course, I entirely agree. Finding a business model that actually makes resilience a paying proposition is possibly the holy grail of what we're looking for at the moment. Well, I, I'm delighted that you both think that because uh, I, I wanted to kick in here with a couple of things that are happening here in the city. Um, so one is looking at the space protection issues. We've begun a, an initiative here, the 695th Lord Mayor's Space Protection Initiative. And this initiative is designed to see what we can do in areas like performance bonds 
um, for space and space debris. In other words, people should be responsibly having the uh, the reserves of set asides and, and the, the indemnifications that they will get their, their stuff down. So that's kind of one area. Another interesting one, of course, has been uh, Chile and Uruguay actually issuing uh, long-term policy performance bonds or sovereign sustainability linked bonds. And we here at ZN helped design the Chilean one that was uh, launched last March. And this sets a framework that Chile will wind up paying an extra 250 basis points, two and a half percent, if they fail to meet their 2030 climate targets. So, uh, you know, very interesting. They're clearly on a path and I can financially make money out of it because I can see uh, that it's there. And I do tend to think that, uh, and I agree with you, James, about the pressures on ministers and the pressure of the Daily Mail tomorrow morning, but people also rely on government to, to take these long-term views, and it's mixing this long-term and short-term that I think is uh, an essential skill and one that uh, many of us don't possess, uh, and we do, throw it, we do throw quite a bit on politicians' plates these days. Anyway, um, in, the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the, the green room, we, we also touched on the idea that these initiatives can interfere with each other. So if I were to make, uh, for example, above ground computing and telemetry and mobile phones uh, absolutely resilient to a Carrington attack, I might increase their cost tenfold or something like that. That's possibly even conservative. Um, but then that would mean that there was uh, less available to help people with uh, flood relief telemetry or se seismology or whatever. So um, just some thoughts on, on, on those conflicts or other examples of where resilience initiatives are actually have the, the potential to interfere with each other. Anybody want to put a hand up? David? I, my, my question would be, isn't that just the price you have to pay for getting on with some of this stuff? But in practice, you will find, you know, trade-offs uh, uh, aren't the ideal, but it's better than not doing anything. So you have to start somewhere. And you know, detecting core, you know, where are our core resilience characteristics? How are we able to, what capacity do we have for handling things when they happen? So these space events on an international basis, for example. These are things where it's, it, it could be the opposite of interference. It could be reinforcing. If you're building up trust internationally in your ability to uh, get together and manage some of these big risks, maybe that some of that will spill off into other areas. I mean, for me, uh, uh, severe weather events and climate change are the things that are really going to make our life very difficult. I mean, accepting what Zana said about space, but... <laughs> The big but for me is these uh, extreme climate events around the world and the conflicts that will uh, spill over from them. And that's where if you could make a start on greater international cooperation, on working on greater resilience of systems, then uh, you know, it's self-reinforcing rather than mutually destructive. Um. Could Just I ask a question? To audience questions, but um, last comments are James. Was that you? Yes, go ahead. Yes. Could I ask a question of Yana? Because uh, my greatest concern is what happens if there is another Carrington event that, because there was a huge solar flare on the 12th of March of this year, just went in the opposite direction from the Earth. Um, but now that we are so completely dependent on electronic stuff, uh, is this as big a threat as I think it is? Because uh, if it did take out the whole of our electric grid and all of our technology depends on electricity, um, it seems to me that it is an existential threat to the whole of civilization. Uh, Jana, do you agree? It is difficult to answer that in a, in a short short period of time, but I will do my best uh, to your question. The threat of a naturally occurring uh, electromagnetic disturbance, in my opinion, is an existential threat that deserves additional attention, additional international cooperation on how to mitigate the, the risks of this event, as well as the possibility of a man-made, a nuclear-generated EMP event. Uh, I 
when I look at emerging technologies and look at the threat, risk, and opportunities presented by them, such as the rise of quantum information science and technology, which could revolutionize the field of computers, while I, I believe that the threat posed by post-quantum cryptography, the ability to break modern asymmetric cryptographic protocols, is a highly, highly critical threat. The one that takes the very top of my list is the EMP threat. And I know that it's a controversial uh, subject among some groups. Um, all that said, I, I believe that this threat, whether it's naturally occurring or man-made, deserves greater international focus and cooperation on discussing what are our what is our incident response and recovery plan for an event such as this, given the broad scope of harm that it could produce across societies? How would we come together to help one another and manage this, this critical event? Even if the probability of it occurring, some are skeptical if, if that day will come to pass. However, other scholars such as the esteemed physicist um, Michio Kaku estimates that we are overdue for another Carrington event. So I, I share your concern about when that day will come and will we be prepared as a community? Good, well, we now move on to comments, question and answer. I've got quite a few here, folks. So we'll, we'll need to be uh, snappy. Um, the first one comes from Hugh Purser. Hugh shared an article with me a while back um, by Marcus Buckingham in the Harvard Business Review, what really makes us resilient. And he was looking at behavioral science research into resilience at a personal level. So for example, things like AIDS and whatnot. But the headlines from that article was that resilience is a reactive state of mind created by exposure to suffering. Um, now, I would define suffering at a societal level as we're now all concerned about climate change, despite the fact we've talked about it for 40 years, because we think we're seeing it. Uh, well, I'll leave that to, to another day. And the second point in the article is the more tangible the threat, oddly, the more resilient we become. We've got something to actually do, and we know that other people will agree with us that something needs to be done. Um, so any thoughts on that? That um, it, it's about our state of mind created by exposure. Yes, that's right. If you are resilient against one potential threat, I think it's more likely you'll be resilient against another because uh, you have that frame of mind. The Scandinavians are well prepared because they feel that they are on the front line of potential attacks from Russia. So Sweden, for example, produced a pamphlet which they distributed to every household saying, uh, saying what to do if crisis or war comes. Uh, that's because they feel that they are on the front line. Actually, everybody is on the front line because of the interconnected nature of the whole of society, as David was talking about earlier. I quite like the phrase adaptive resilience as well because when things happen, you learn lessons. You, know, you learn that you probably put the electricity transformer, our previous generations put it on a floodplain and it would be more sensible to put it on top of a hill. Uh, and having a resilience as a process where you are learning all the time and then applying, so you don't bounce back to the state you were in before the event occurred in the course of the event, you are learning how you can actually move on to a better state. Mm. Uh, and it's taken us some time, I think, in certainly in the British government, to come to that conclusion that resilience is not just about how you, you know, get a blow and then you bounce back. It's about mm. how you bounce back better as a result of the rather painful experience you've just had. Okay. Let me shift along to another question here. Uh, we, we've got a, a, a viewer listener out there who doesn't want to be identified by name, but I do appreciate uh, the comments that they've shared with us. They refer to a critical incident in 1976, which is a nuclear submarine fire uh, in Liverpool, and they were involved in that crisis. And that convinced them to run uh, crises ever since, uh, exercise crisis exercises. Uh, and of course, one of the things in this is we always hear about agile and accurate communication seem to be the key to managing critical events. Um, here we're talking today a little bit about 
pre the event occurrence. But what's your panel's view on whether or not accurate and agile, agile and accurate communications are key? And John, I'll start with you. Uh, thank you. If I could um, briefly build upon David's point in acknowledging the more philosophical question before pivoting to this one, I appreciated the audience member who raised the philosophical note on resiliency. And there's, in my opinion, no one better to discuss uh, resiliency than the great ancient uh, Greek philosopher uh, Epictetus, the school of Stoicism, who taught that everything in life has two handles, the one by which it may be carried and the other by which it cannot. And I think this truism is helpful in analyzing resiliency in the wake of uh, international security uh, crisis or a national security crisis. Um, moving now to the second question, it, it strikes me that when considering the decision-making process of how to use a, a limited finite amount of resources in response to an event that is unfolding with a variety of stakeholders, it's helpful to have a framework. So I'm going to take a more abstract approach to addressing this question. Um, drawing upon my background as a former systems engineering professor, one systems thinking framework that we recommend is breaking the problem into four different series and looking at both the meta system, the system, the subsystem and the elements, breaking it down to its irreducible parts and, understand, and to understand better how it functions, understanding that every insight into this ecosystem reflects a partial blindness that we have in that moment. Um, the four phases are problem definition. We want to first understand what exactly is the problem that we are striving towards solving or understanding better. And then once we have properly defined the problem as our output, we transition to solution design. We're generating ideas on how to address this unique problem set, drawing upon historical factors, legal factors, environmental factors, could be moral and ethical frameworks, technological constraints as well. And then once we have selected a single solution to, to act upon, our decision-making phase, weighing the cost benefits, trade-off analysis, then we implement it. But the story doesn't stop there. It's an iterative process. Something invariably will go awry uh, in our execution of the plan. And speaking to resiliency, when it does fail, we embrace that setback as a output from the system that we can use to then build a more durable and resilient system. It's a constant iterative cycle as a framework to go forward and learn. I mean, yet I, I it's rather yeah. sent to me, uh, Mike. The, I've recently published a book, How to Survive a Crisis. And there's a lot in it about commun public communication, because if you haven't got that narrative right, then people are not going to have confidence in the authorities, so they're not going to follow the advice that the authorities give them. And actually, you are going to need everyone to be supporting each other. Uh, I mean, every crisis in the end is local. It's real people that get hurt. Mm -hmm. And so if you haven't communicated what you're trying to do after the great event you know, that it, uh, ha, ha, has hit us and what people can do to help each other, all of that, without a wave of cynicism about, well, we don't trust what the government is telling us or the, this corporation or that corporation, uh, they're only they're spinning the story, uh, minimizing the risks and so on. It, you know, it does require, I think, a lot of straightforward, honest, uh, including honesty about what we don't know about the event as well as what we do know. Um, and trying to create a sense of uh, involvement. I mean, President Zelensky's narrative to the people of Ukraine it's been stunningly successful in rallying them uh, around and getting everyone to feel that they can do their bit. Yeah. Well, I, I would like to turn in the, the last session. There have been a, quite, quite a few interesting comments about analog. I'll come back to those in a minute. Uh, and there's actually a tongue-in-cheek society, of which I am patron, oddly, in the city. I didn't think it would be relevant today. <laughs> um, it's the Society for the Pre Preservation and Promotion of Analog as a Reasoned Choice. Um, I probably shouldn't be talking about it uh, online, but <laughs> I'll mention it. And we, we, we only send uh, letters to each other, handwritten, et cetera, as, as you could imagine in, in something like that. 
Uh, but it's not really a, a joke in some ways. Um, you, you spoke about the um, Nordics and the East. I spent a week in Estonia and people seem to think it's about Ukraine, but actually they were hit by um, the cyber attacks in 2003. So, and they, they're very focused on resilience and, and, all, and seem, to, seem to have achieved a lot. Um, so what we've got here is a, a comment from uh, Gideon Oguni. Uh, recently, most threats to the power grid come from the consumption side as home devices, smart hubs, EV chargers are created by third parties and used by consumers with little or no security practices. Uh, the poor grid operators do not have direct control over the end user advices. So we have resilience uh, coming up in, in that area, just on, just on some of the basics. But then Stephen Murgatroyd is, is worried about you know, are we going in the opposite direction, switching off voice over copper wire? You know, look at the Ukrainian army, which has started using World War I field uh, uh, telephones. Uh, and Simon Clifford makes the same point, losing copper-based telephone infrastructure, literally ripping out resilient capability alongside public telephones, um, uh, you know, it, it is really an interesting problem. And we, we as society seem to focus on hyper-efficiency so our stockpiles of PPE equipment disappeared and nobody really noticed or cared. And then suddenly it became, so I really love your thoughts on this. You know, when, when do I decommission things? Should I never actually decommission anything? Um, and okay, I'll turn to you. because you a lot of The Royal Navy had to face, do they continue to train naval officers in the use of the sextant? Hmm. Or do they say, no, 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 we've got all the GPS you could possibly want. The same is true of map reading. We don't teach kids how to read a map. And indeed, maps are becoming rather a scarce object because you can just look at a screen until it's not there. I'm the proud owner of my high-tech uh, slide rule, which I used in early on in my studies. And it's a precision instrument, but of course, now, why would anyone think of even learning how to use a slide rule? We've got calculators until the microchips get fried and then we haven't. Mm. Okay. okay. Michael, you talked about stockpiles uh, and we have pared down our stockpiles uh, through the just-in-time process to an extent that it has really damaged resilience. And uh, Richard Barron's uh, former uh, senior, uh, senior member of the armed forces um, has said that resilience is really threatened by just in time. Um, we've got enough food in this country to last us in the, into the middle of next week. But if the uh, if the ships can't dock because the computers are off uh, or uh, there's some war in the channel, then we will be in real difficulty. And so I think every household and every organization needs to take some sort of responsibility and command for their own resilience. And that needs to be done in discussion with the government. So there needs to be much more communication about what needs to be done beforehand. Communication is indeed key uh, in a crisis, but uh, there needs to be the capacity to act in the absence of communication if the telephones are not available or the computers or the internet are not available. So there needs to be a prepared and practiced plan about what to do if things go wrong um, and it needs to be stored, that plan, somewhere not on a computer. Hmm. Jana? I agree with David that proper planning prevents poor performance here. Communication, especially having a plan set up for when your, your primary source of communication fails, what is the alternate? What is the critical communication mechanism after that? And then the emergency communication mechanism in place after that, whether it's doing tabletop exercises as a uh, convening vehicle to bring stakeholders to the table to work together on a, a scenario, a, a bad day scenario, of whether it's an EMP Carrington event or, or something else catastrophic, how 
how are we prepared or and not prepared as a nation to address those those critical vulnerabilities? And it also is an opportunity to have those important in-person discussions to build build relationships. Yes, we can have plans written out on a, a piece of paper, but the human connection behind all of this is so important. While we discuss resiliency of systems and resiliency of having a, a plan management uh, and financial uh, management uh, systems in place, it's important to also recognize the human component that drives all of this. I mean, that is so important because the value of exercising and it doesn't have to be very elaborate, it can be done around a table, is that if you have the right people around the table, the people who will on the day have to take those decisions, they get to know each other. They get to know the kind of information they would need in the event of that kind of crisis uh, to, to manage things. And uh, they can then at least produce the modules of plans that can be assembled once you know precisely what it is uh, you're dealing with. Uh, Zana's entirely right, of course it's flexible, but the, uh, the process of planning, and you know, Churchill said this, Eisenhower said this, it's, it's a truism in, in the crisis management world, but getting people to re really understand uh, how they would be able to work together find solutions to problems that are that are uh, difficult. I put in my book a whole chapter on the preparations for the 2012 Olympics in London, where exercises were used to bring all the decision makers together, get them to know each other, get them to trust each other, and crucially to work out what information each of them would need from the other if, there were, if the games were going to be run successfully, which of course they were. Great. Well, uh, John, I thank you for leaving out the second adjective that normally goes with uh, performance in, in, that, in that discussion. Um, uh, if I may, I'm just going to turn to a final comment, uh, which I think uh, we, we, can, we, we can bring things uh, to a close after that, and the panelists will be making a closing statement and summary of how they've seen this. But it's actually from Madeline Moon, uh, who has appeared on these programs before. Uh, Madeline, delighted that you contributed this. Uh, David, you referred to... Um, uh, local and also about the need for flexibility. Um, James, you know, you were speaking about uh, taking back responsibilities. Um, and Madeline is asking, how do you encourage the center to devolve responsibility, planning, and money uh, to devolved areas, devolved governments, and mayors? James, I'll, I'll throw it to you because I think you've got <laughs> quite a few insights here. Well, Madeline knows a lot about this. The fact remains that it is the, uh, for example, the devolved authorities that will be responsible for dealing with crises on the ground as they happen. David uh, said earlier that all crises turn out to be local. And the government's response until now has been secretive and opaque and centralized and it needs to be exactly the reverse of those things it needs to involve the whole of society it needs to involve local authorities to empower local resilience forums and to recognize that uh, if it doesn't the crises will be blamed on the governments because the local authorities do not feel sufficiently involved, which at the moment they don't. Um, so Madeline's question is, as I would have expected, absolutely spot on. There's a psychological instinct, I've seen it so often um, when, when crisis arrives, to try and centralize decision-making. And as you say, the, it is, should be the opposite. It's mission command. The center gives the strategic direction, releases the resources, uh, uh, that takes emergency powers if they're necessary, but actually pushes responsibility down the line. Um, and you can see why it happens. It's because, particularly with ministers, the media, people are terrified that if you devolve the uh, authority to act 
outwards, people will get on with it and the results may be inconsistent or they may not be exactly as the centre would have wanted. But that's in a sense irrelevant. It's this instinct that you don't centralise in a crisis. You use mission command, you decentralise. Good. Shana? I would just add to that point that trust also sits next to resiliency at this table when we talk about the importance of having a resilient system or, or plans in place trust in the relationships that we're building here uh, and having the personal courage to speak up if you if you see that the emperor has no clothes having that personal courage to be that voice alone in the room that maybe has a contrarian viewpoint to to speak up and share that because others may be looking at it differently but that input is helpful in scoping out the the, the ever evolving ecosystem here for resiliency and and um, strength going forward mm. um I'm going to ask a very quick question, and probably to James and David, if I may. It's just a quick yes or no type. Simon Clifford's curious. Has there been some any good modeling of what it would look like to have one year of subsistence food, fresh water supply, distribution of supported law enforcement, et cetera, um, possibly under martial law? But you know, could we run the country for a year? Has anybody looked at that and said what that would cost? I'm not, not in this country. I think not in this country, but in Scandinavia, the answer is probably yes. I think in Sweden and in Norway and in Finland, I think they do that and they've got good models there, but we don't. Okay. David, any? No. Okay. The, uh, just, we've got to be prepared to look around the world, as James mm. implies, because no country's got it all right. Yeah. But you can find everywhere people doing sensible things, and we just need to find out what those are. Um, my family originates from the Orkneys, and up there, 100 mile an hour winds are commonplace. So, if you've got a hen house or a, an outhouse or a shed, you put steel cables over it and you anchor it to the ground, and that's just taken for granted. Now, there's quite a lot, I think, that we could all be doing without getting down to subsistence levels, but just to recognizing that we're very fortunate. The, we can go into a supermarket, we can buy anything we like, the supply chains all work until they don't, which is the point that James was making. And sometimes it would be good if perhaps in education, in schools, we just kind of remind kids they are very fortunate but there are many parts of the world that are on subsistence, uh, but people survive. Okay. Well, we're going to, we're going to move to kind of um, uh, summing up, but while we're doing that, uh, please uh, do answer the poll questions that's coming before you, uh, having listened to this. Um, panelists, uh, we had a, an interesting point from Stephen Murgatroyd, I think uh, supporting you about taking lessons from abroad. He suggests taking lessons from Norway on sovereign funds for resilience and infrastructure maintenance that are protected by law. I myself lived in Switzerland, and I'm not sure if it's a year, but it's certainly six months that the Swiss think that uh, they've planned it for. So it's, there's a lot of attitude of mind here type thing. Uh, the audience have pretty much voted. We'll give it just five more minutes. Um, and just before um, I hand over to you for your final comments, uh, Hugh Purser, uh, falling on the 70% uh, of pessimists in the audience, uh, says that the constant iterative cycle uh, should be a positive mindset, uh, but it lives in an environment of blame and liability, and that leads to box ticking and backside covering. Is that the cycle that needs to be broken? Um, anyway, as you can see here, uh, the audience have really agreed, I think, with you. It's not so much about allocating resources effectively, much more about coordinating the parties, identifying the hazards, and doing what you can on preparedness. So panelists, I think you've uh, convinced them. It's not what I thought the results would be. So well done you. But if I may, I'll turn and I'll go in reverse order if I can. Uh, again, just a quick minute of summing up. Jana, what do you take from all this and what other point might you like to make? The point I would like to end on is 
space sustainability, sustainability and resiliency, uh, particularly as we look at the growing number of satellites. Uh, earlier this week, the Euroconsult's World Satellite Business Week uh, conference was convened and the Secretary General of the ITU, uh, Doreen Bogdan Martin, said that the growing risk of collisions between satellite and debris threatens the progress that satellite systems are making at enhancing communications. We touched upon that in our session today. And also, it threatens bridging the digital divide. And how we address that separate issue of the digital divide also touches upon cultivating national resiliency here, whether that's increasing cybersecurity awareness or that is improving digital literacy in one's country, that how we are taking actions to bridge that gap in the digital divide feeds into cultivating resiliency. Wonderful. James, your thoughts? Um, rather than the points I've made, made I'd like to pick up uh, on the brilliant point that David made about the value of practicing and exercising in building key relationships, because it's only if those relationships are fully confidently held that the value of practice and the value of exercise will get through to the public. So I thought that was one of the most important points that was, was made, and I want to uh, agree with it wholeheartedly. Thank you. David, last comments yours. Yeah. I just want to make a plea to keep the most careful eye out for what I call slow burn crises. These are the situations that we suspect, and sometimes we know, year on year are getting worse, or the possible calamity is getting closer and more probable, yet we don't do anything about it. In the UK at the moment, we have real problems over aerated concrete that 30 years ago was put in public buildings. It has a 30 to 40 year life. Those years are up yet we don't have, we didn't have a fully funded plan to do anything about it. And so finding those other areas where if we don't start acting now, then eventually the crisis will burst. It's what I call the slow burn crises. And they're much the hardest because to tackle them means the government's got to put its hands up and say, well, we've ignored this for the last 20 years, but now we are, I'm afraid, going to have to do something about it. And the temptation to say, no, well, let's leave it till after the next election. Somebody else can pick up the problem. It's there. Yeah, it's a, it's an interesting issue. I think we're, you know, it's a, it's a bit like that film, uh, which uh, Stephen Murgatroyd has pointed out to me, don't look up about the asteroid coming and the, and, and the absurdity of it. A, a good film to watch, folks. Uh, so thank you, Stephen, for that reminder. Um, and Hugh Purser says, you know, the background to what all our excellent speakers are saying seems to be that no bad event occurs in isolation. Um, but I just point out there's something I spent um, lunchtime today on, on one of my boards. We had two hours of ethics training. I spent a lot of time on whistleblowing, speak up. You know, how did we know that we actually gave a culture where people could do that? Uh, talked about the, the importance of trying to avoid uh, retaliation and things. But uh, Simon Clifford says, the voice, that voice of truth to power, or you might call it the emperor's new clothes, sadly is career limiting for many in government and the civil service. So there is a culture point here. And in some senses, we, we seem to be admiring Ukraine. A large part of that is, sure, it's charismatic, inspiring leadership, but it's very much also the ability to harness the innovation of its citizens. Um, and I think that's that's not a bad Point to end on. Um, I've uh, certainly been heard to say more than once, and I'll say it again, um, let's be optimistic. Pessimism is for better times. Uh, and I would like to thank uh, most heartily our uh, panelists for such great insights, uh, dialing in from all, all the exotic locations you're in. Um, I'd like to say City Forum is ever a pleasure to work with you. And I'd like to thank you, the audience, for your vibrancy and your contributions today. Uh, it's a discussion that will continue, and I'm sure we'll be doing it with City Forum. Thank you very much. Thank you.